Yeah. So okay, which could confuse. then, uh, then you can Confuse move this. this. Yeah. Then what I will do is this. Then I will back myself into a corner, literally, <laughs> so that more people can come and. Uh, hello, thank you. This looks very interesting. The dark chocolate lover, smooth and fruity. Very nice. Which was 51. 51, that's what I also thought. It's easy when there is no gap, no? Yes, 51. Yeah, see, so nice this is. Ah, ha, ha. Back to the corner. Yeah, I'm backed into the corner so that more people can come. Did you, is it possible to leave a message on the online classroom in case anyone comes late? Yes, yes. <coughs> where is that? You can do that. I think um, you said you already did. Hmm. No, I didn't. Yeah. Oh. You can do that. Whoever wants can do that. Is this on? Live stream? Yeah, it's on. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, there is also a chair here. Uh, and uh, the, I, I don't buy it generally. Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvina Badhi Tamas Roma Vidvishavahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. We are coming upon in the text a very big section. Uh, which ranges from verse 51, that's why we stopped there last time, from verse 51 to So these 10 verses, actually no, no, uh, I, I want to take that back uh, till yeah, till 64, 51 to 64. So all these verses, they are talking about a very big topic in the in the in the vision of Vedanta in the tradition this is in fact knowing this alone one is free of all kinds of samsaric influences on one's life what is a samsaric influence <laughs> huh? anything objectified ah, anything that is objectified is not necessarily sam samsaric but that's the beginnings, yes. And then when that objectification is subjectively internalized, that is samsara. Because you see, if, if I say this is flower, it's not samsara. I'm objectifying this flower, am I not? Mm -hmm. am I say, uh, I'm saying I the subject and this is the object, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm objectifying the flower. But then this is not samsara. You know, the samsara is when the subject-object differentiation is obfuscated and the subject takes itself either to be the object 
Ah, I am as good as this flower. Or without this flower, or the subject takes itself to be the object. There is an object, subject, confusion, conflation at the level of the discerning reality. Or the meanness, not the meanness, meanness and the minus comes in uh, you know, having some kind of a relational connection to the object. That is also samsara. So you see, for samsara, either of these conditions have to be uh, true, not both, either. One is that the subject-object mistake must be made. You know, and with, uh, no one says, I am as good as flower, but everyone says, I am as good as the body. <laughs> you know? Dehe nashte aham nashta. If you want to put, sound fancy and impress your friends in Sanskrit, you know, when the body is destroyed, I am also destroyed. I is as good as the body, right? Is the body subject or object? Object. object. Abba, thank God. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> body is object. Yeah. And then, I, I is the subject. The I happens to be living in the body. But the I is not the body. You see, there is the subject-object obfuscation. And so that is samsara. Nobody says, I am as good as this flower. But everybody says, I am as good as the body, I am as good as the mind. Before Vedanta, everybody says that. So that is one thing. Or there is a relational connection using the preposition me, mine, all those kinds of, uh, you know, sorry, the pronoun, me, mine, etc. So this is a flower, no samsara. This is my flower, samsara. This is what I mean by samsaric influences. So we are happening upon, in the text, a very important section, the next 13 or so verses. And what are they? And they are talking about the nature of the I as that which not only transcends this Small body, mind, sense complex. Small? You can say, no, no, I'm big. Please turn that off. Yeah, one is enough. So, it's off, Swami. Yeah, yeah, it's good. good. Text. Yeah, here is the text. Take. Yeah, we try to discourage electronic reading in as much as possible. Take that text, yeah. <laughs> so then, <laughs> so what happens is that even if I don't think my body is small, it is small in terms of that which is occupying the body, which is the cause of this universe. That presence which happens to be indwelling this body makes the body and everything else that it quote-unquote occupies very, very small. Because that presence is all. <laughs> so whatever it happens to occupy is small. Because when the all occupies any thing, and, and again when we talk of all, what are we trying to say? We are saying, you know, that which as though occupies. It doesn't really occupy. There's nothing to occupy. Occupy means some things that are confined in space and time. Because if you occupy, last year there were all these movements in, two, in 2012, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy DC, there was even Occupy Eugene. So if you were occupying DC, you could not occupy Eugene at the same time, correct? <laughs> Why? Because the body can only be, a said body can only be in a said place at a said time. This is what the body and the non-permeability of the body, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mass that occupies a certain space at, at a given time. So T1, S1, B1, body 1, <laughs> correct? <laughs> this is how it goes, this is the laws of physics. <clears throat> but here what we are talking about are not the laws of physics, but the one that observes and categorizes the laws of the physics. The witness of it all, that is I myself, and the, this I that we are talking of, transcends the bodies and the minds and the senses and everything that it is there, 
it endows everybody with a presence but since the presence is all everybody becomes small pun intended <laughs> you know all bodies become small because what is quote unquote occupying this body is that which is all so then the nature of this i is redefined as the one that transcends this body mind sense complex okay if it transcends this body mind sense complex what is this thing really because i need to have a handle on recognizing this what is this thing that transcends the body mind sense complex what is this thing and then you know so we come upon a certain definition a definition of this i that cannot be disputed oh but i what if i am a non believer non believer in what i oh you don't believe in i no i don't believe in i oh that's very interesting who is saying that i <laughs> so the i you don't believe exists is saying i don't believe in i you see the the funny part of this it's like there is one disease i forgot the name of it somebody who is medically inclined may know there is one disease where the person refuses to you know where the person is convinced that they are dead there is a disease obviously it's not a disease of the body <laughs> it's a top story disease yeah and it is you know it is a, a a a real mental illness where the person refuses to be convinced that they are alive so you try various experiments you pinch the person and wait for the person to say ow oh. see a dead man will not say ow oh. that means you are alive and the person will say no this only proves that dead men can also say ouch that's all they will say <laughs> that's all they will say so this is like the person saying i don't believe in i i don't believe i exist it's nothing to do with your belief it's a fact that you exist is a fact you know whether it's a comfortable fact or an uncomfortable fact for you and the loved ones you still exist <laughs> it's a fact you cannot dispute it you can dispute beliefs but you cannot dispute a fact but i need proof how do you know i exist how do i know i exist because you are able to talk because you are able to even have the freedom to question this the one who is needing the proof that presence is an existent presence when you say something is present it is existent you cannot say a non existent presence is haunting me you cannot say that doesn't make sense so therefore we have to come with certain undisputable definitions of this i and the first one i have already given away what is that is, is. it's the presence and the sanskrit word for is is asti. asti and asti has come from sat as to be sat in the sense of being so this is the first definition of this new i the new i that is never an object always a subject never subject to objectification and the new i really is as old as older than anything that is there then why are you calling it new only in terms of the discovery <laughs> because the discovery happened in the vedanta class oh it is new <laughs> because i discovered it right now and you see it's all i centric that's why it's called new because it's i centric the upanishad the ancient texts go along i love them because they go along with our ignorance and as soon as the ignorant jiva jiva means the person who was previously in samsara you know even 5 minutes ago but has come out of samsara so this jiva 
you know, is, is told. You are. I is. You are. And you are not just this, you are that, which is beyond this body. You are not confined to this small little body, mind, sense complex. Ah, I have discovered this. And the Upanishad says, therefore, one of the names for the I is called Puranaha. What is Puranaha? It is a, yeah, it means ancient, but actually it's a compound. It's a very ingenious compound. It's like SMS language, which is where two things are taken and, you know, initials of two words and are put together. Pura means ancient. Nava, ever new. Pura plus Nava. Purana. Mm. This is Adi Shankara's, you know, uh, uh, what's that? Understanding in the Mundakopanisham, in the Bhashya. He talks about that. Purana. Purana means what? That which was ever there in the same manner and which is ever here now. And when I say it is ever here, ever present, ever now, now I am, and then if when you say now I am, that unchanged I also was a long, long, long time ago. Idamagre asit asti eva bhavishyati eva. So asit was. Asti is Bhavishyati, will continue to be. Eva means indeed. Bhavishyati evam in the same manner, unchanging. So you see, this cannot be disputed. This definition of isness cannot be disputed because it is a fact, <coughs> it is an eye centric fact. If a fact is centered on something else other than the eye, it can be, it becomes a place for hypothesis, testing, retesting and all these things. But if it is centered on the eye, it needs no proof because the proof is in the existence. That is not dependent on anything else. That is what we say self-existent, self-effulgent, self-reliant, self-lit. And the Sanskrit word for that is Swatas Siddhaha Swataha on its own Siddhaha Siddhaha established self established. You don't need somebody to prove that you exist. When that day comes, you know, then that means it's time to get a checkup. You know what kind. You know, because it is not something subject to proof. It, you, you are the only proof of your existence. And in this country, we have so many certificates of this and that. We had a Vedanta course just now, we finished last week. We had a certificate. And then, you know, everything is based on, uh, you know, little forms and things. Everybody has a social security card. Then, uh, you know, health card, credit card, this card, that card. But if you go to any office and say, I need a certificate of existence, you know, they will certify you. That's all they will do. <laughs> you know, that is all it is. That, or either that or they will say, typical bureaucracies, oh, that is obtainable, I think I'm the fourth floor, please go there. <laughs> and the fourth floor will send you to the, uh, the second floor and then you'll be going up and down literally. Either, one, either of those scenarios I can see happening if you go request a certificate of existence. Arsha Vijnana Gurukulam has a certificate of existence. I can show it to you. You know, it was established in such and such a year and this is the name of the ashram. It's operative here, here, here. We have a certificate of existence. But that is for Jada. <laughs> jada means what? Inert. inert. What's the opposite of inert? <laughs> Art. So, <laughs> Chetana. <laughs> Chetana, like apt and inept, correct? Yeah, slightly different then. So inert and sentient. Chetana, sentient. Jada, inert. So you need certificate for existence for perhaps jada things. 
but not for that which is chetana, which is sentient. You certainly don't need to establish the I because it is, it is there, it is you, it is Puranaha, it is unchanging, it is unafflicted by anything. It is in the same manner as it was ages ago, before all this came into being. When you say all this, this whole objectifiable Jagat, this universe came into being, including this body-mind-sense complex. The I was unchanging, unaging, no wrinkle cream, no, you know, any kind of, uh, what is that, what is that these celebrities have when they, facelifts, yeah, no facelift, no trip to Florida, because that's where you have to go to get all these lifts. <laughs> Yeah, not without any trips to Florida. Atma is ever young, always unaging. That's why, you know, this is uh, very beautiful. So, uh, Atma means I. I am unaging. I am not subject to age. What to talk of death? Death I am not subject to. Aging I am not subject to. And unchanging in any period of time that you look at, unlike the photo albums, which thankfully the digital age has done away with because nobody buys them anymore. <laughs> yeah, you just buy more space on the device and store everything in the device. All the desires are stored in the device. And then what? Then you know, when you want it, you can't find it, even if you have categorized it, which is Bhagavan's latest blessing. Because before, when you looked at the photo album ten years ago, oh, how much strength I had, especially if it's some holiday photos. Oh, how much strength I had. Look, I climbed this whole mountain and the top of the mountain, this picture was taken, look at me now, you know, just a bag of, uh, just like a sack. <laughs> Everything is, you know, everything is hanging out, literally, and, <laughs> you know, look at me, so sad. Thankfully, the digital age has done away with this, it dispensed with all this. We don't need all this. It has totally dispensed with this. We don't need to look at ourselves ten years ago, five years ago, you know. And the digital age has made something very interesting because instead of looking at yourself 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, you are looking at yourself every 5-5 five, five minutes because you are taking photographs every 5-5 every, every five, five minutes. And then nobody notices the aging in a certain way because it's too close. This is a big blessing. But if you took a photo with your iPhone of the Atma, Long ago, B.C. <laughs> but how iPhone can be in B.C.? Time travel, okay? Yeah. Expand the imagination, yeah. Sci-fi trip. You take a sci-fi trip, you take the iPhone back to then Julius, Caesar, or even Alexander, not, not so great. You take, you know, click a photo of Atma, what will come? Nothing, because it cannot be objectified. But supposing you were able to capture the Atma in the time of Alexander not so great, what would it do? It would look exactly as it does now. That is the unchanging eye. Eye that never goes into oblivion. The eye that can never be objectified the eye that is not subject to aging, death. What about disease? The eye without flu shots has never come down with influenza or any kind of illness, has never broken a bone. Why? Impartite eye. <laughs> has never had a stomach upset. <laughs> Why? Because the eye is never upset, mentally or physically. So this I, that you call I, myself, has never been sick, never had to go to the doctor, 
never had to have a cast you know the bone bandaged never had to have even a bandaid never was depressed so this is the body dharma mind dharma never had dharma means attributes never was subject to depression there is a disease called sad what is this sad ah seasonal affective disorder what is the season for it now <laughs> yes when the when you look at the what is it called the weather proclamation for eugene it always says sunny and 55 <laughs> i think it's a conspiracy to not get into the seasonal affective disorder because you know maybe in the next day will be better the next day will be better the next day will be better and we keep going and then we find it is neither sunny nor 55 any of the days that it has been saying that it will be both sunny and 55 so like this you know the the psychologists and the and the doctors say that if you keep going like this when it's always cloudy then the some perhaps it's a form of the deficiency of the vitamin d or something which makes one subject to doldrums who is this one the body mind sense complex not the i the i is never taken any pill in its life not even a chill pill it has not taken it is exempt from everything and is exempt from this sad syndrome no disorder it's subject it's not subject to any personality disorder because we are not talking at this level of the i we are talking of not the personality but the person itself purusha that i which is everything and the the word for person is purusha sans the personality because here we are talking of that which has transcended the personality the personality comes and goes and is subject to change but the purusha the person is the same so at the level of senses again no change the i that we are talking about never has to go to the optometrist to say i don't see very well i think i need to change the glasses no no upanetram problems <laughs> ah upanetram means glasses no upanetram problems why because it's a point the i is that which is the subject matter of another upa upanishad <laughs> yeah the i is the author of the upanishad it is the content of the upanishad it is that which the upanishad reveals as which is free of uh, needing glasses yeah mind you a small caveat here the upanishad does not reveal the i what yes the upanishad doesn't reveal the i the upanishad reveals only the nature of the i as free of fear and sorrow just what we are talking about because all the sorrow all the fear all the insecurities if we examine them one by one even though they may be centered on many and varied things they all boil down to one thing and one thing alone fear of myself being finite this what it is that's why everybody gets scared when you get sick everybody gets scared when they get you know somehow feeling old tired whatever it is lack of you know energy as one grows older and and one cannot remember especially all the grudges that one had kept you know an excel sheet of meaning properly categorized <laughs> and then you wake up why was i mad at this person for 20 years you cannot remember this is bhagwan's blessing it's a blessing see ishwara's blessing it's all ways of letting go 
But back to our point, the senses are not affected, you know, by the, because the Atma, the eye, doesn't have any sense organs, nothing. It is just that which the Upanishad reveals as that which is always the same, which can never be negated. And therefore the, the, the twofold strong emotions, the primal emotions of fear, first fear is of course a very primal emotion, and if there is a second primal emotion, it's sorrow. And even though they are emotions, they basically run the whole universe, really. That is what is called samsara. When fear and sorrow, you know, provide the fuel for the collective and the individual activities of humankind, this is what is the definition of the word samsara. You look at, take anything, you can immediately trace it to these, one of these, you know, sources. Take something like venture capitalism. Why would one venture into this territory, severe fear of what? Loss. Fear of what? Losing money. And why, why, why are you so interested in money? No, 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 money buys things. What does it buy? It buys time so I can be longer on this earth. This is what it is. For a rainy day. What if, what if I'm in the hospital for one century? I should have the money to pay the bills, whatever comes. I need insurance. So all the insurance from life insurance onwards. You see, it is based, it is run by the power of fear alone. Life insurance, this insurance, that insurance. And then there are some people who really capitalize on these things. There are religious leaders in, you know, in India who say, would you lie? We cannot assure that you will go to heaven. That is your job, you know, to do whatever it is, charity and good deeds you do. Somehow get crashed there, you know, you know, or declare you are saved because some religions allow for that. So then you, you go to heaven, that's your job. We are not going to give you, uh, we are not going to take you there. But once you are there, would you like to have one acre plot next to your house, where there are no neighbors, because this fellow couldn't stand neighbors in life. One acre plot. And would you like it wooden with, you know, orchards, mango groves, and guava trees? Yes, that's sounding very pleasant. And would you like a 2200 square foot house, manageable? Or would you like a 5,000 square foot mansion? In which case you'll have to hire some help. So, if that's the case, you make a donation here, now. And I will pray for you to be translated into five mango trees and an acre plot and a nice cottage without any neighbors in the vicinity, in the afterlife. You see, even that insurance, you know, I think we should name this, it's, it should be called Shady Grove <laughs> Realty or something like that. <laughs> so even these kinds of things, this is a very big scam. This is a horrible scam. And uh, this is based on what it's, cap the, every scam is capitally scamming or skimming off of your own fears. And for every scam, there is a fear on this side, you see, a corresponding fear that is waiting to be manipulated, capitalized. This doomsday scam, this 2012, I mean, we, we got sick of hearing how everything was going to come to end. What day was it? 12th October or something? 12th December? Something. December 12th, yes. That everything is coming to an end and the Mayans said so, you know. Not one is available to ask, but in, in, you know, without asking they said, they said so. A wrong understanding. And there were doomsday insurance people that sprung up and then, you know, 
said this is what it is you have to just pay some money and then we'll be sure that something will happen you will go to heaven or something like that i forget what it was but this was also capitalized so the whole economy the whole society individually and collectively is driven by fear driven totally by fear nothing else other than fear and and so we have this which is something to really look at because when you look at this totally it is mind boggling this is what samsara is it is also driven by sorrow or rather we should say by the frantic attempts to overcome and avoid sorrow yeah so you look at the pharmaceutical industry every day there is a new antidepressant in the market the number of antidepressants available is enough to make one feel depressed why do we need this <laughs> you know as a humanity why do we need so much antidepressants but it is in one way i suppose it's a mixed blessing because even the pharmaceutical industry understands that the nature of this eye is not to despair and feel depressed the nature of this eye because the sorrow is seen as an aberration in every culture in every society nobody says oh we are happy being so sad <laughs> nobody says that this is again a universal fact sorrow is not seen as something which is wanted it is something to be dismissed it is not real it is not the nature of this i this is something we know we know we sense it that's why we have all these antidepressants we have support groups you know i saw one very nice uh, caption long time ago and it said the first annual convention of the adult survivors of normal parents and normal childhood <laughs> A big hall had been hired balloons and the banner the i this is what i told you was in the banner and there was one person holding the balloon <laughs> one attendee <laughs> i think it would have been equally efficacious if there had been no attendees <laughs> so you see that that craving for that happiness that craving for that quote unquote normalcy that itself that craving for you know to 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 overcome any kind of trauma childhood or otherwise all these support groups and all these efforts and then the spiritual parties why should they be left behind you know they also cash in and the spiritual organizations and the teachers maybe gurus they call themselves the gurus say you know here is an instant recipe for happiness instantly you can feel happy and we hear so many stories true stories where there was one ashram somebody talked about this it came in the papers a while ago and as soon as this was in india somewhere as soon as it you went into the ashram you had an uplifted feeling oh oh ha 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 this must be the bliss that all the books talk about this must be that ananda translated as bliss which every you know everybody is in search of and as soon as you came out of the lecture hall or the place where that assembly place uh, i don't feel so good and later on they found that they were pumping some things into the room yeah mood elevating feeling yeah we are not talking of aroma therapy that is not you know that is some illegal things yeah we are not talking of little lavender and you know those kinds of things <laughs> you know those are also mood lifters but nothing 
it, it's not harmful. You know, people who are subject to depression are told to buy some, what is that, that eye pillow, you know, pillow for the head I knew, but after coming to this country, now there is one pillow for the eyes also, yeah. Two separate pillows? No, one pillow with a little indentation for the nose, because the nose doesn't have a pillow, only the eyes, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and then, so there are two, and that, that is filled with lavender and uh, something called uh, this uh, uh, chia, chia seeds, flag seeds. And then you put that, or you have a little spray bottle and you spray the lavender on your pillow and then the blues are also chased away. So lavender is good for chasing away the blues. And incidentally, we also found out that it's good for chasing away spiders. Yeah. So along with the blues, the spiders also go. So lavender is good. But we are not talking of lavender being pumped into the room. It's harmless. We are talking of other substances, you know, laughing gas, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you see, this is the extent to which this, this whole, this whole happiness has become a production Meaning what? It's the avoidance of sorrow, avoidance of fear, and naturally gravitating towards happiness, towards security. This is what is called, you know, eva meva. Adi Shankara says, in this manner only, the whole world proceeds. This is what is called pravritti nivritti. Nivritti avoidance of discomfort, fear, any kind of languishing, sickness, affliction, sorrow, nivritti, avoidance, pravritti, going towards with full force, comfort, security, you know, anything that makes me happy. So there are religious groups which, which give, which have the claim of instant happiness, then there are also other groups you can join. Why groups? Even without groups, I'm a loner. Okay, you have your own digital universe. You don't deal with a real universe. You deal with a digital universe as though it is real. That's why it's called virtually real, virtual reality. This is what it is. And you cannot stand people in this life. People cannot stand other people. But then they go on a website to become friendly with some, you know, fictional characters and take the case in point of a Chinese new parent of a seven-month-old child that were arrested for child neglect and uh, endangerment. The child was all bones, it was starving, it was sitting in a chair, a bit like a high chair where it was, you know, strapped. And what were the parents doing? The parents were playing a game in the digital universe on the internet where it's possible to have a, a virtual child and they were completely obsessed with this virtual child and taking care of its needs. And they forgot the real six month old or seven month old sitting in the high chair and the child had not eaten for, it was on the brink of starvation. Had not been eaten or, or had, not, had not eaten and had not been changed or attended to. And it had cried itself to unconsciousness. And the neighbors, I think, called the police. This is the situation. So you see, there are, even if you cannot deal with people, you have a digital universe of fictional characters with whom you can interact, whom you can befriend, and with whom you can have a, you know, have tea. And then there is also all these anonymous people on, on all these social media spaces. I told you the story of a young girl who said, a teenager who told me 
when I was giving out prasad, coming in line, can you please like me on Facebook, Swaminiji? I said, I like you on your face. Why I have to go to Facebook? But this is what it is. Amassing likes on, on this uh, Facebook and all these other sites. This is what the extent one will go to deal with the question of feeling insecure, subject to sorrow and fear and non-acceptable to oneself. The whole society will go to the extent of devising little band-aids to cope with this primal question, why do I not like myself? What, what is wrong with me? This is a very basic question. Why am I not acceptable to myself? Why do I have to be something or do something constantly to amount to something? Why do I have to amount to something in order to just be in my own glory? Why? Instead of looking at that question, all the technological progress, the innovation and the social progress is really devised, is really, you know, centering on how to avoid further. Really, that's all it is. It's like putting a band-aid on the Grand Canyon, trying to put it together, you know. This gaping wound of humankind and instead of looking at this wound and seeing what, how can I minister to this wound, what is the, a lasting remedy, instead we are just trying to make new band-aids as a society. The answer lies where the problem lies. The problem is in a wrong definition of the I. The answer in the, is in the correct definition of this I. And it's not enough to just define, it's more of an identification. That's why it's called identification. Yeah. <laughs> Some dent has to be made before the I <laughs> can finally say, <laughs> yes. And here is where the problem has to be restructured and understood because this is the problem, this is the primal human problem. It's not the problem of doing. It's not even at the level of being. The being is fine. The doing is actually one's undoing. So what is the problem? Understanding this being is the problem. And so therefore we have these very important verses coming up. And one of which we have already looked at, one of the definitions. What is that? Is. Is means in Sanskrit, Sat. And that Sat which is free of fear and sorrow, which is non-negatable and unchanging. An undisputed fact, which is the meaning of the word I. That is the Sat. And it's the same Sat in I. And it is the same Sat in you. It is the same sat in this table, in this flower, in everything that is sentient and insentient, chit jada. It's the same sat that, that quote-unquote occupies this entire universe of names and forms. Same sat. And then, very interesting because the sat, the is, happens to be a sentient and a knowing is. A sentient and a knowing is, is what occupies, as it were, even the insentient things. So really from this standpoint, the sentient, insentient definition becomes moot, as it were. Because the chair is sat, and also has the presence of this knowing sentience, which we call chit. Sat chit. Chair is sat chit. Oh, then what am I? Not chopped <coughs> liver. Sat chit. <laughs> sat chit. Sat chit. Body is also sat chit. Everything is sat chit, sat chit, sat chit. So along with Sat we have added Chit. The Is happens to be a sentient knowing Is. 
It's not the presence that we are talking about that occupies the entire universe of names and forms happens to be sentient. A presence that is alive, a presence that is knowing. Then if the chair is Satchit, then how come the chair is not giving this talk? The chair should also wax eloquent. After all, it has had a lot of Vedanta, correct? Yeah. <laughs> it has been listening for a long time patiently. Yes. And even if it is not understood properly, it should have a few grudges and grouses. I am always the under chair. I am, you know... <laughs> I am being sat upon. What about my rights? Nobody is, you know, listening to me. It should also say a few things. But it just sits patiently. So basically, so where is the chit? The chit is inhibited, not in its presence, but in its expression. That's what we say. Why? Because the chair doesn't have a subtle body. Table doesn't have a subtle body. The camera which is looking at me, so which is helping me to look at you, all of you there, does not have a subtle body. Otherwise it will say, I want to look at other interesting things. What is this stupid orange, you know, being I'm having to look at day after day in and day out? Take me out, take me to the vistas, the landscapes for which Eugene is famous. In fact, put me on a cruise, it will say, I want to go to Caribbean. Why I have to look at the Swami all the time? It's very bored. <laughs> but that doesn't happen, not because the, the chit is not there. The chit doesn't have a way to express itself. That is what is called sukshma shariram, a subtle body. Subtle body, if it is present, then there is ways of communicating, there is ways of connecting, there is ways of expressing something. We need not be in words. You know, animals have subtle body. And, uh, you know, somebody uh, sent me a video where the master had trained the dog to say, I love you. Dog speaking, yeah. It sounded like glub, glub, glub to me, but you know. But I think if you heard closely, it did say, I love you. Actually, it managed it. I think it, the, the, the dog learned to imitate the master's intonations, and the master would say whatever it was, I love you, in a particular, uh, you know, with the indentation and the certain tones, and the dog would comply and mimic that. But even if this talking dog were not were, were not to talk, it can still show how much it loves, correct? Yeah. Why? Sukshma Shariram is there. Subtle body is there. So the chit has a place of expression. Subtle body is that which affords the chit a place of expression. Very nice. So this is the second definition of the eye. The chit is very much there. It's a, it's a presence which is a knowing presence. So it's a being, being is equal to is, and this isness happens to be a knowing is, a presence that is a knowing presence, a being that is a knowing being. Knowing means what does this being know? Because the verb to know is a, sensi is a transitive verb, correct? We call the grammar lessons quickly now. What is transitive verb? It has an object. Ah, it has to have an object. If I say, I sit, nobody asks, what do you sit? What do you sit on? That's different. I know. What do you know? It's a transitive verb. And so when I say knowing being, what does this being know? You know, this is a very interesting thing. Because when I say knowing being, it's not that the being knows things as an object. But the nature of the being is an all-knowing being, a knowing that transcends the subject-object differences and dimensions. I will explain that. 
more. Because everything that I know is an object of knowledge, like flower. This is object, I am subject. And then we can migrate to, you know, see this is Pushpam and this is Ghataha, pot. Flower, pot, I know flower, I am the knower, this is the known, I know pot, I am the knower, this is known. Now I say I know flower pot, <laughs> I am the knower of the flower pot and this is the object of knowledge. But you see here there is a, there is already the duality that is sneaking in, correct? Between know or no, we are talking of that I which is, doesn't have any divisions. How does the I manages to be knowing without this division? This is a very interesting and a Compounded question, very interesting question. How does this I, you know, know, is a knowing being, you say? Yes, I do say that. How is this I a knowing being without creating this division? Because whenever I say no, I am divided from what I know because I am not the flower and the pot, correct? I am the knower, I am separated from the flower and the pot because they become the object. I am the subject. And supposing the flower pot could talk, the flower pot would say, I am the object of consciousness, I am not the subject. Correct? So how is this knowing being that we call I transcends or comes out of this tangle of this divide because when it objectifies something, it is not that which it objectifies by definition because you cannot objectify something. And here it's a very ingenious way to look at this. The secret lies in not looking at the subject or the object but the presence that unites them both. Because what is an object? The break is going to be five minutes late, okay? Yeah, just <laughs> letting you know. What is an object? An object is that which the subject is not, correct? And so if you really unpack what is an object, what is flower? Flower is a cognition. In fact, even before I show this, if I say flower, something happened, you have already cognized the flower. Where? Here. A picture of a flower, maybe not this particular flower, but some flower, your Ishta flower, <laughs> your favorite flower, comes to mind. Already you have seen the flower. And when I say flower, it's no longer cognition. What is it? Recognition. In fact, even the English language recognizes this, recognizes that this is actually a recognition because the cognition has already taken place here in the form of a thought, a mental frame which has put out the thought of the flower. The vritti or the mental modification, a modification that has happened in the thinking faculty which says which has now modified to assume the shape of the flower thought, as it were. <coughs> so, flower thought is chit is <laughs> chit sat, sat chit, flower thought is, and flower thought is conscious because this thought, you know, has morphed as it were into the flower. That's how the cognition takes place. And then what? Then when the flower comes to light, there is a matching up of that cognition which has happened here with this which you see. And then that's why you say, I recognize this to be flower. There are technical terms, vritti vyapti and then phala vyapti. Vritti vyapti means what? That 
thought, flower thought which has gone and encapsulated that flower and brought it to the mind in a certain sense. The flower thought that has gone out, that has sent the signals of the flower out to search for the flower and phala vyapti, that which has taken back to the, that mirrored the flower back to the mind. This is how the, the cognition takes place of any object, the recognition rather. But then when we look at this closely, we find that in every thought there is one unchanging thing and then there is one changing thing. What is the changing thing? The object of the thought. So if I say cognize flower, yes sir, <laughs> something happens. And then cognize pot, yes madam, because that atma satchit is beyond gender. So yes, yes, done, done. Okay, can you please cognize book? Oh yes, book, done. So the, the object of this conscious presence keeps changing. But what about the subject? Who cognized flower? I. Who cognized pot? I. I. Who cognized flower pot? I. I. Who cognized book? I. I. That unchangingness of the knowing I, which is always a knowing I, with or without an object of consciousness. You see? The object of consciousness, now here we have made this satchit into a new word, consciousness. So the object of consciousness, satchit, the objects are just words and meanings, names and forms. There are millions of them, billions of them, trillions of them, where the subject is only one. The objects come and go. The objects really speaking, the text will show later, are not outside of the subject. The subject stands apart from what it objectifies. This is how the knowing being called I gets out of this subject-object division. So it assumes the status of the knower only when something to be known comes in front of it. And again, that which is known is not outside of itself because we have already said this is also satchit, this is also satchit. But this is satchit plus knower, this is satchit plus known, and so satchit plus knower and satchit plus known are what? Satchit. Knower known comes, knower known goes. It's all satchit. So there is really no division. So this satchit, the chit is the second definition of the I. So now we have established that it is, the I is, the I is a knowing being, Satchit. And this knowing being, what kind of a knowing being is it? It's a limitless knowing being. Limitless means what? Not limited by time, not limited by space, not limited by being an object, a particular, confined to a particular upadhi, a form or a name. And so, that limitlessness is what one calls happiness. That happiness is what everyone seeks. And that, when it's not understood, creates the society called samsara, which is trying to seek happiness through all the difficult ways possible. <laughs> difficult ways through which one distracts oneself, through which one tries so hard to quote-unquote become happy or to stay happy, through so many devices, through so many desires that are morphed into so many things, really it's all one particular desire, one particular thing to be happy, to be, is to be limitless. And the society, the whole universe goes about it in the wrong way, completely in the wrong way. So what is the correct way? 
we'll see after the break. <laughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Hi Om 20 minutes, whichever time zone you are in, and then we will come back. You can turn that off.